Uh, right, my name's Neil Jervis, I'm from an organisation called Resonate, the Recruitment Social Enterprise. Um, does anyone know what social enterprises are, first of all? Social enterprise is a broad term, it doesn't really mean anything, there's no actual definition other than it's a company that trades for societal or environmental purposes. SIPFA did a study last year and found that anyone could call themselves a social enterprise, so it doesn't mean a great deal, but it's part of this movement towards ethical capitalism. Uh, certain people think social enterprises will replace business, but that's incredibly naive. We see social enterprises as enabling companies to act more ethically. So today I want to talk about why we think that companies will take the driving role in transforming our communities, recreating communities and building a better business. By better we think we mean, well, fairness and equality, which is what pretty much everybody wants. Uh, we have utmost faith this will happen, I suppose we are eternal optimists, but if you look at, uh, I suppose, the history of business, 50 years ago, businesses are infinitely better now than they were 50 years ago. Perhaps the last 25 years, it stalled slightly, but we think, I suppose, the modern events of bankers' bonuses, phone tapping, we think these are actually, in a historical perspective, probably quite a positive thing, because these be a capitalist, uh, a catalyst rather, companies to, to have to change and this is I think the key point is companies won't act to improve society just out of altruism uh, it, they will have to have a business benefit for themselves uh, progress only comes through arrangements that are mutually beneficial we think this is actually we're at the vanguard of a new movement now I suppose this argument of pragmatism or altruism is sort of the key one and a lot of people will talk and say what drives CSR activity. Is it nice people at the top that just genuinely believe in a more just society or is it people at the top that are scared of losing all the consumers? Uh, we think it's both. You know, If you look back at the Victorian mill owners who built affordable housing, provided healthcare, started charities, what did they do it for? Was it just to make sure the workers kept going to work to create profits? Or was it that they genuinely cared about the people? The answer obviously is both. And we think, as I say, that now there will be a period of probably sustained change over the next sort of 15 years. Now, obviously the incidents I've mentioned are key, but I think the key factor is social media. Now, the magnifying glass on all the bad behaviours, if you like, is getting so great uh, that now companies genuinely are scared about losing their consumers. Uh, and customer experience obviously is absolutely at the forefront of this. <coughs> now, I suppose ultimately, if, if we talk brass facts, the community engagement, recreating communities, we believe will enhance relations with employees, which we'll talk today about engagement, how you can engage with employees. Our firm belief is that the vast majority of the people within organisations care about fairness and care about <coughs> equality. Now, most people that dread going to work in contact centres and all these other myriad of positions, uh, we think a big driver within that is that essentially they see the company as this big faceless corporation and all it cares about is making money. So if the companies can fluff themselves up, for want of a better phrase, uh, put people before profit uh, and really put their money where their mouth is, we think there will be substantial change within employee engagement. So currently companies will, is it tokenism, is it greenwash, what do companies actually do CSR? Now Lord Buller's painting fences are on employee volunteering days, is that really helping charities? Uh, making contributions to the big nine charities where nobody's got any idea where the money goes, is that actually helping society? Quite possibly not. Now, in terms of the mutually beneficial aspect, obviously companies need to engage their frontline staff. Now, the, within customer experience, which is our background, the difference in engagement levels of the staff is, is so, so stark. Uh, 15 years ago when I started work for Manpower, I referenced people going into work at NatWest Bank, and candidates used to wait six, eight weeks for a written referencing period. Uh, it was 10 year written references, so, we had to get the candidates to track down their former headmasters from primary school to sort of give references, and they'd do it. They would do it unwillingly. Now, now the case, unfortunately, even with you know pretty much a shortage of jobs, candidates won't wait two weeks to start a job in a contact centre. Now, this isn't anyone's particular fault. It's just the way contact centres have evolved, uh, and they have propagated this myth that the focus is on the customer. Uh, now. 
it's not true, obviously. The focus has been on appeasing the shareholders and appeasing the bus. So all this talk to the advisors about quality, 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 the customer at the heart of everything we do, the minute the SLA is at threat, it all goes completely <laughs> out of the window. Now, so people talk about why are advisors disengaged. It's pretty obvious, we think, because there's this massive disconnect between what the company says it's trying to do and what the company actually does do. So how can you get those advisors engaged uh, and how can you engage your wider stakeholders? Uh, mutually beneficial, as I said, is the key. So we think customer experience has a huge opportunity because there's huge opportunities for the customer experience industry within the UK. If it can continue to lead and it can be the market leader in terms of customer experience functions, there's no reason why the big multinationals won't build capacity around UK contact centres. Now the big growth will obviously come from the BRIC countries. Uh, there's currently something like 800 million people within the BRIC countries that earn £6,000 a year. Uh, by 2020 this will be £1.6 billion. Now traditionally all these countries, particularly India and Brazil, will actually love to offshore to the UK because uh, of cultural differences, because of historical prejudices. The idea for Indians to call us to get their train times would go down an absolute treat. So, how can the UK increase its capacity? So, you obviously need to recruit more staff, you need more uh, advisors, but the attrition levels are so high. So, you can look two obvious places. One, abroad, all the European countries that are struggling at the moment, bring people over en masse, work from the contact centres here. Probably not going to do much for your consumer base in the UK. The other area to look at is the youth. Now, youth unemployment is spiralling, it will continue to go up and up and up and up. Uh, and the underclass unemployment is pretty stark. Um, in terms of, I mean, the most startling uh, figure we've seen recently is young black males, 16 to 24, there's literally half now are not in education or training or employment. Now, I'm sure all of you will sit here and say, well, we've given young people a chance and they want it on a plate and they're lazy and they don't care and we're far better going to get Polish people because, you know, they will perform an awful lot better. Absolutely true. Nobody will argue with you at all. So, what do we do? Do we just sort of damn a whole generation or do we take collective responsibility and think, well, actually, some of our companies that have driven this behaviour, driven this rampant consumerism, driven this sort of fascination with celebrity and something for nothing culture. So, we either accept it or we change it. Changing it is not that difficult. It's a lot of cash and it's a lot of expertise and it's about rebuilding the youth communities. Now, <coughs> in Manchester, where we're based, there is literally no youth service now, literally none provided by the council. Uh, and you might be able to share some sort of figures from, uh, from where you live, but youth services across the country are massively a threat. Now, what do we do? Government as a whole is quite happily now, smaller states, biggest hates big society, desperately try not to say big society, but uh, government as a whole wants to be smaller, so the opportunity is there for business to step in. It is very simple. There is 220,000 charities, there is 60,000 social enterprises, the vast majority are incredibly malleable and want help. So if you're trying to achieve your sort of CSR goals or whatever's driving you, you will find charities and social enterprises which will essentially, if you give them the cash and you give them the expertise, they will carry out your wishes. So in terms of what you want to do, it's not that difficult. A lot of these kids just need mentors. A lot of them have no strong role models in their life whatsoever. A lot of them live in the same locality and can spend 15 years before they move literally two miles from where they live. So you give them education, you give them mentors and they will prosper. And you're tapping into a completely dormant talent pool for ideas and innovation which currently nobody has access to. People talk about money making the world go round and creating growth but that's absolute bullshit, it's ideas. So the ideas for the next generation of entrepreneurs will come from there. So, we would sort of say, stop messing around, you want to act more ethically, you really care about improving society, it's about challenging up, it's about challenging the bosses, the executives to say, you will lose, you will lose consumers, uh, it, it will happen, uh, and if you're not ahead of the curve, then you will get left behind. So, there's our little socialist rant, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> slightly tongue-in-cheek in part, but hopefully uh, there's some 
conversation point straight in from that. So please, please shoot us down.